All right, class, welcome to chapter 15, the trace minerals. So although this chapter is called trace minerals, that does not mean these minerals are not important. They're very, very, very important, as you will see. This is a picture of a woman harvesting seaweed, I believe in Indonesia, and seaweed is actually a really good source of some of the trace minerals. Iodine, for example, is very abundant in seaweed. So a little bit of trivia throughout this lecture. The most common nutritional deficiency worldwide is, hopefully you guys selected iron. Iron is the most common nutritional deficiency worldwide. Um, it's anticipated that over 2 billion people have iron deficiency and about 15% of the population has iron deficiency anemia. So iron, what is it? Remember all of these things are minerals. So this is literally a picture of iron, the mineral from the periodic table of elements. And these are a picture of some iron rich food sources. Iron has been recognized as an important mineral for many, many years. Um, and so it is very, very vital to our body. We're gonna talk about some of the functions of iron coming up. One of the things that iron does is it helps with oxygen transport. I shouldn't say it helps, it pretty much facilitates oxygen transport. We could not transport oxygen without iron. It also can help transport carbon dioxide, which is a waste product. So iron is actually a part of our red blood cell and it's a molecule called hemoglobin. So within our red blood cell, there are hemoglobin molecules and each hemoglobin molecule can bind to iron. Without iron, we would not be able to make a hemoglobin molecule and our red blood cells would not be able to carry oxygen. Iron deficiency anemia, like I said, this is the most common deficiency anemia worldwide, and this will cause pale red blood cells, red blood cells that can't carry oxygen, fatigue, tiredness, stunting. We'll talk about many more symptoms coming up. So hopefully you remember from what I just said, but hemoglobin, hemoglobin, is the name of the protein found in red blood cells that can transport oxygen. So functions of iron, it helps form hemoglobin in the red blood cells. And right here I have a picture of a hemoglobin molecule. Right here um, is the heme part. And so there are actually four heme parts within a hemoglobin molecule. Iron also helps form something called myoglobin. So hemoglobin is in the red blood cells, myoglobin is in the muscle cells. And in the myoglobin molecule, there is only one heme, but it can still transport oxygen. Iron is also important for metabolism. It's also important for immune function as part of like blood cells. It specifically can help the brain, it can help with drug detoxification, and can help synthesize collagen. <clears throat> this is an expanded model of hemoglobin and myoglobin. And here you see um, this hemoglobin molecule blown up where the iron is in the center and the iron can bind oxygen. And in the myoglobin, there's only one of these. So some trivia that you may not know yet. There are different forms of iron and there's different sources for iron. Some of those are more bioavailable than others. So which of the following is the most bioavailable form of iron? You may have said heme iron, and we're gonna talk about heme iron coming up, but heme iron is iron that is found in animal proteins. So such as this liver here, or this seafood up here. Sources. So you saw a picture of some sources on the previous slide and we're gonna further investigate sources coming up. 
Major sources in the diet are ready to eat breakfast cereals. This particular chart says life cereal, but any breakfast cereal that's fortified with iron could be a major source. Um, beans, animal products are also major sources. One thing to note, milk and eggs are very, very low in iron and potentially even have zero iron. So even though they come from animals, you might think they would be a good source of iron, but they're not. And this leads into me saying, um, sometimes children who drink a lot of milk and don't eat a large variety of foods or animal proteins could be iron deficient. You may notice here that the RDA for women is much higher than the RDA for men. And we will talk about this more coming up, but the main reason for this is due to the menstrual cycle where women are losing blood and blood contains iron. Iron absorption. So our body has a very, very tight regulation system for absorbing and excreting iron. And the reason for this is because us having adequate amounts is very, very important. However, us avoiding toxic amounts is also very important. So many things affect absorption, the first of them being need. How much do our bodies need? Um, we actually have a set of checks and balances to determine our own body's iron status and then increase or decrease our absorption levels. We actually recycle iron in our bodies and this helps us conserve iron so that we generally have um, more available than if we were to excrete all the iron. So we actually recycle about 90% of the iron in our bodies. Dietary forms of iron, um, depending on which form, which food source you eat your iron from, you could have increased or decreased absorption. And so we're going to explore these a little bit in just a few minutes, but I, I actually wanted to go back to this need part. I didn't quite fully explain that enough. So with regard to need, when your iron stores are low, there's a protein that's called transferrin. And this is needed to transport iron. And so when you have low iron stores, your levels of this protein increase and its affinity for iron increases so that you can absorb more iron from your diet. If you have enough iron circulating in your body, um, that transferrin, that transport molecule is saturated, it's full of iron. And so there won't be any spots for additional iron to bind and that iron will be excreted. <clears throat> okay. Now I think that we've covered need, we can check that off. Diet, we are gonna talk more about heme and non-heme coming up. Um, phytic, oxalic acid, fiber, and polyphenols. These are things that are found in plant proteins and they could be in spinach, rhubarb, chard, whole grains, bran, and soy. And these actually reduce our absorption of iron. So these all cause decreased iron absorption. Um, absorption, I'm just gonna abbreviate there. Zinc, magnesium, calcium, these all have a two plus charge, which is the same charge as iron. And so these can compete for iron absorption. And so if you're taking high levels of those at the same time that you're eating iron, it could reduce your absorption of iron. Things that increase iron absorption. So all these things decrease it. Um, all these things increase it. So something called meat protein factor or MPF, which we're going to talk about, vitamin C, and having adequate gastric acid, which is your hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Okay, so what is this heme versus non-heme iron that I've been talking about? Heme iron comes from hemoglobin and myoglobin, which is found in meat, fish, and poultry. Remember, it is not found in dairy or eggs. Heme iron is not very affected by some of those interrupters to absorption, such as the phytates and the oxalates and all of those things. And so we actually absorb a pretty high amount of heme iron. This particular slide says 25%. 
um, I have seen up to 35% depending on the textbook. So we can absorb a lot of heme iron. And heme iron, like I said, is found in meat. However, meat is not 100% heme iron. It's about 40% heme iron. And the rest of it is what's considered non-heme iron. So it's about 60% non-heme iron. Non-heme iron is found in meat and it is also found in vegetables. However, vegetables and plant protein sources only have non-heme iron. They do not have any heme iron. The non-heme iron's absorption can be affected by many of those factors I just discussed, such as the phytates, the oxalates, et cetera. And this particular slide says it is absorbed about 17%. I have actually seen much lower numbers than this. I have seen between two to 8% of non-heme iron is absorbed. Um, but I could imagine it would depend on exact, the exact food source as well as that person's iron status as well as you know, gastric acid, vitamin C, and other factors playing a role. So non-heme iron comes from an plant sources and we do not absorb as much of it. Heme iron comes only from animal sources and we absorb a lot of it. But remember that animal sources also have non-heme iron. Okay, how do we absorb it? So this is gonna be kind of in a nutshell. I'm not gonna to go to too much detail about this, um, but we start by eating iron, and then iron can enter our mucosal cells in the small intestine, and iron can be bound to ferritin or transported in the blood by a protein called transferrin. Iron that is trapped in the mucosal cells by ferritin is lost when the cells die. So that would be in this instance. So this would be trapped iron, trapped, bound by ferritin. Um, and it would be excreted if our body has plenty of iron with our intestinal cells. If we need iron, that ferritin is gonna release it to a protein called transferrin. Transferrin is a transport protein, and that is going to allow iron to travel through the blood and go to well, places in the body that needs it. So this would happen, um, this bottom part would happen if we had low iron, this side part would happen if we had high iron and we didn't need any more. Iron storage and excretion. So I just mentioned that when our levels of iron are high and we have plenty of iron, iron will be bound to a protein called ferritin and that ferritin is within the mucosal cells and those mucosal cells will be shed off in the feces. And so that is the way that we get rid of it. It won't enter the bloodstream. Um, we can store iron in the liver, the bone marrow, and the spleen, but if these three areas are saturated, we will reduce our storage form of iron, and it will be all in this ferritin. As far as recycling goes of iron, we do recycle 90% of it, like I already mentioned, and this is done primarily in the spleen. 10% is excreted in the stool. And the reason it's excreted in these mucosal cells, um, trapped in them, is because once it's absorbed into our bloodstream, it's actually pretty hard for us to get rid of it. Excuse me, okay. So iron recommendations. I already mentioned that women have a higher RDA for iron than men do. After the age of 51, most women have probably stopped menstruating and are in menopause, and so they're no longer having that monthly iron loss. It's estimated that the monthly iron loss during the menstrual cycle by women is as much as one gram a day. So you can see why women would need this higher level. Vegetarians 
um, will need more iron than non-vegetarians. And the reason for this is because the non-heme version of iron is absorbed at a lower rate than the heme version of iron, and a vegetarian would not be consuming any heme iron. Deficiency is pretty common, and specifically with women and adolescents, only about one quarter of adolescent girls and women of childbearing age meet their RDA for iron through the diet. And I know from many classes, diet analysis projects, I have had many, many students who have noticed that they've been low in dietary iron intakes. And then they've also commented, hey, I feel really tired. Maybe this is why. So college is a time where you can you know, diversify your food sources and really think about iron and if you're getting enough nutrients through foods that you eat. And if you're not, maybe you know, have your iron levels tested, go see a doctor and talk to the doctor about a supplement if that might be helpful for you. There is an upper limit of iron and we will learn about this coming up, but it is possible to have iron toxicity. So that can be very dangerous. Iron deficiency. So I already mentioned that this is more common in women and adolescents of childbearing age. Iron deficiency first and foremost can cause an anemia, meaning the red blood cells will not be able to carry oxygen and or there will not be enough red blood cells produced, and that is specifically because of the lack of iron. So you won't be able to form that hemoglobin protein. Deficiency can be described as far as kind of three levels of deficiency. The first level of deficiency involves depletion of iron stores, but the person doesn't really show any symptoms. The second level of iron deficiency involves um, def deficient levels of iron that's stored in transferrin. And so I don't mean stored, I mean being transported by transferrin. So there's not enough iron being transported into the blood. And some um, symptoms can display at that point in time, including reduced heme production. And the third kind of level of deficiency is this severe anemia where the red blood cells will actually be small and they'll be pale because remember iron is actually a red colored molecule and they won't be able to carry enough oxygen. So what this is called as far as iron deficiency anemia goes is a microcytic hypochromic anemia and microcytic means small cells hypochromic means pale cells because you won't be able to carry oxygen you will feel very very tired um, you'll have reduced energy metabolism reduced immunity reduced cognitive development in children you may feel cold you may have reduced appetite you may have reduced attention span um, reduced work performance. Just think about all of the organs that need oxygen to survive. Well, that's every single organ in your body. And so if those organs aren't getting enough oxygen, they're going to be functioning and growing at a suboptimal rate. So this can actually cause severe growth and developmental as well as physical um, delays. People who commonly have iron deficiency, I already mentioned women and children. Um, women during pregnancy are especially at risk of iron deficiency because they have an increased blood volume as well as they could be losing blood during the childbirth. Um, what else? Infants who are breastfed exclusively beyond six months and not given an iron supplement may have iron deficiency. Athletes commonly have iron deficiency because um, they can actually lyse some of their red blood cells during running if they are runners, and they can lose more iron in their stool as well as their urine. Too much iron. What happens when you get too much iron? So unfortunately, you can actually die from too much iron. This isn't that common in adults, but this is common in children. Sometimes children will find your supplements and they'll think, oh, these look like candy, or oh, look at these gummies, and they'll overeat them, and it can actually be toxic. Um, it can cause liver and heart failure, abnormal blood pH, and can be life-threatening if over 60 milligrams are consumed. So they do have some precautions to help avoid toxicity. One of them is this warning that is printed on all the bottles. 
um, a second precautionary measure they take is individually wrapping any iron supplement that has 30 milligrams or more so that it would be more difficult to eat a bunch of them at once. There are some genetic diseases that can cause iron overload, but we're not going to explore those in this chapter. Zinc. So here's zinc on the periodic table of elements. Looking at this, it looks like some sort of prehistoric, I don't know, grenade or cannon or something, cannonball. Um, and it's hard to imagine that this is something we absolutely need to survive. But zinc is found in many foods. Here are just a few pictures of them. And it's involved in so many different reactions. Um, one of the primary actions of zinc is in something called zinc fingers, which are structures within our DNA that link single amino acids together. So histidine and cysteine are linked together by zinc fingers, and that can actually uh, help our DNA fold appropriately. Other functions of zinc. Zinc is involved in over 200 enzymes as a cofactor. It helps with production of hemoglobin. So if you had low levels of zinc, it's possible that could lead to anemia. It helps with growth, development of sexual organs. It stabilizes vitamin A in the eye and helps with night vision. It helps make vitamin D receptors. It's involved in our white blood cells for immune function. It's a component of something called superoxide dismutase, which is a powerful antioxidant that helps protect cells, and it's involved in hormone activity. So, so many functions of zinc that are all very, very crucial. Where do we get zinc? You already saw some pictures of some meat products on the front page. We can also get zinc from fortified cereals, seeds, whole grains, nuts, legumes, leafy greens, um, yogurt, cheese. One thing to note, when you mill grains and process grains, zinc is actually lost in that um, processing milling process. And zinc is not one of the items that they add back when they fortify grains. And so this is one reason specifically why eating a whole grain would be better than eating a refined grain. Zinc that's found in animal food is slightly better absorbed because there are no fiber uh, or phytates to reduce its absorption. Okay, so absorption. Absorption for zinc is kind of similar um, to iron. However, different than iron, it's easier for us to eliminate zinc. So, yeah. So we can eliminate zinc in our urine, our feces, and our sweat. I already mentioned that animal sources are higher in zinc that is easier absorbed versus plant sources. Some components of plant sources that might limit absorption are phytates, fiber, tannins, and oxalates. And high levels of phytates can actually and has actually caused zinc deficiency. This has been observed in many populations. High intakes of non-heme iron because iron will bind and compete with zinc for absorption and non-heme iron is going to be found in plant foods which are generally higher in these phytates and fiber and oxalates. Calcium because it shares the same charge as well as copper um, can also compete with zinc for absorption. Supplement form of zinc is not as well absorbed as the food form of zinc. And I mentioned that zinc is not um, as available in some plant and grain sources as plants. However, if you are making bread with zinc and you add yeast to the bread, that yeast actually reduces the effect of the phytic acid in the grain um, of the bread and so can help increase that zinc absorption. They have observed deficiencies in populations that commonly eat unleavened bread. So that was one of the first kind of recognizations of the important role that zinc played in growth. 
And so this is exactly one of the populations that I'm talking about. This happens to be an Egyptian boy. Um, in Egypt, it is common for them to eat unleavened bread, meaning there's no yeast used to leaven the bread. This particular boy is 16 years old, and he is 49 inches, which is four feet one inch tall. So he is very much shorter than an expected height would be for a 16 year old. And in his particular case, the reason was a zinc deficiency. Additional things that can happen with zinc deficiency, um, taste changes, loss of appetite, poor wound healing, hair loss, and birth defects and infant mortality. Well, zinc deficiency is possible, excess zinc is also possible. And one of the reasons that there is an upper limit for zinc is that high levels of zinc can lead to problems with copper metabolism. And there's also an upper limit because toxicity can occur from foods or supplements where some minerals and vitamins, usually toxicity is more common from potentially just a supplement form. But zinc, it could be from either food or supplement. People who do take a zinc supplement should be medically supervised and discuss this with their doctor so that other nutrients of concern can be monitored, such as copper, calcium, and iron. Some of the symptoms of zinc uh, toxicity, loss of appetite, so that was the same symptom as zinc deficiency, impaired immune function, reduced copper absorption, and reduced copper-containing enzyme activity. And we're going to talk about copper coming up. So then you can see how if we weren't having adequate copper because of zinc, that would create a big problem. Zinc and the immune system. So some things about zinc. There are some common misconceptions about zinc that zinc will boost your immunity. And this is only true if you have a zinc deficiency. If you have adequate levels of zinc, taking a zinc supplement will unfortunately not help your immune system. But if you do have deficiency, even a mild deficiency, it is possible that zinc supplement can help. So remember I said that excess zinc could cause a copper deficiency, and so that would mean it would be really important to learn about what copper is and what copper does. Copper and iron have similar food sources, and they actually have similar absorption and some similar functions. So what are the functions of copper? These are just a few functions listed, and I'm going to talk about some more. Copper is important, is a part of enzymes, and it is it plays a role in one specific enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which is an important antioxidant. So copper has an indirect role as an antioxidant. Copper also helps in enzymes that create crosslinks in bones, so it helps form some of that bony matrix. Copper regulates neurotransmitters and helps synthesize neurotransmitters. It's involved in nerve myelination. The myelination on nerves is the protective outer coating surrounding a nerve. It's involved in the electron transport chain. It helps transport iron out of the intestinal cells and to the bone marrow, and it's involved in the immune system. So, so many really important functions of copper. Where do we get copper? So I mentioned that some of the copper sources were similar to iron. Um, organ meats are very, very high in copper. So we've got liver here. Seafood is also pretty high in copper. You have oysters, lobster, um, you know, different things like that. There are also copper, uh, copper is also found in seeds, whole grain breads, cereals, chocolate, nuts, and um, also cereals. Severe deficiency is pretty rare. However, toxicity can occur. And regarding plant sources of copper, plants may be higher or lower in copper depending on how rich the soils were. As far as copper deficiencies go, the group of people most likely to suffer from a copper deficiency is a preterm infant. 
um, who's recovering from starvation or potentially somebody who has had an intestinal surgery. Okay. So I just discussed who might be deficient. I mentioned infants and people require, uh, recovering from intestinal surgery. Somebody who's taking really high levels of zinc could also be at risk for copper deficiency because they'll compete, zinc will compete with binding for copper. Somebody who has altered iron status or sorry, copper will result in altered iron status, and this is because copper is needed to transport iron out of the intestinal cell and into the bone marrow. And so indirectly, copper can cause an anemia if you can't get iron to the bone marrow to form the red blood cells. Copper deficiency can also cause impaired growth, high blood cholesterol, um, reduced immune function, and abnormal collagen formation. Copper and zinc are pretty closely related, and zinc will stimulate synthesis of a zinc binding protein, which can bind copper, even if copper is low. So this is one of the reasons that taking the high zinc supplement would not be a good idea, especially if not supervised by a doctor. Toxicity is possible. The upper, limit, upper level is 10 milligrams. And this usually happens due to an accidental overdose, uh, copper contaminated food or water, or there is actually a genetic disease called Wilson's disease where copper can accumulate. Some of the signs of toxicity are diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, liver damage, and neurological issues. So I thought I'd just talk very briefly about Wilson's disease because your book doesn't cover it a little bit. And we don't spend a lot of time talking about these kind of genetic diseases, but this one is a little bit of an interesting one. And like I said, this is a genetic disorder that results in excess copper storage. And when you're storing excess copper, you are not getting rid of it adequately. And so it can accumulate in the brain, the liver, the kidneys, the heart, um, and many other organs and actually cause quite a bit of damage. It is recessive, meaning it's passed down from family members and you need to get a copy of the gene from two family members to get it, so mom and dad. And it can actually be fatal. One of the treatments for this involves avoiding foods that are high in copper and then taking a medication called a chelating agent, which can actually bind to copper and help you eliminate it. Iodine. Okay. So you may notice that I have not talked about every single mineral in this chapter, and that's okay. I'm trying to focus on ones that um, you will see on your exam. It doesn't mean that the other ones aren't important, but we just have limited time in this class. So iodine. So iodine is found as I2 in nature, and it's present in food as iodide and other forms and it's important for growth and energy metabolism and really only has one main function. So which of the following can lead to a goiter? Is it iodine deficiency or iodine toxicity? This is actually almost a trick question. It is both. It is A and B and we will talk about why coming up. Oh, a goiter. So let me tell you a little bit about a goiter. This is a picture of a goiter, and iodine is very important for the thyroid hormones. Um, when iodine levels are low, there's something called thyroid stimulating hormone, which tells the thyroid to grow in an attempt to absorb more iodine. And so the thyroid just kind of grows and grows and grows out of control and this goiter forms. And the goiter is not painful. It's obviously a little bit um, potentially visually unappealing or different. However, it can kind of smash or compress your trachea and uh, esophagus. So potentially it could cause maybe swallowing or potentially breathing problems. Um, and if you needed to treat this goiter, you would probably have to surgically remove it. Taking iodine does not usually make that goiter shrink. So usually it would have to be surgically removed. Okay, so functions. 
iodine has one function and one function only. It is important for these thyroid hormones, thyroxin and triiodothyronine. I can't say that right, thyronine. Um, and so, yes, that is the only function. There's only one function of iodine is to make these hormones. However, these hormones regulate all of metabolism. And so, that being said, Iodine is involved in all of these functions as well, because without these thyroid hormones, we would not be able to have any of those functions. Um, so, yeah. T4 is the most common circulating thyroid hormone in the body, and T3 is considered an active form of the uh, thyroid hormone in the body. Food sources. So where do we get iodine? In the United States, most of our iodine actually comes from iodized salt. And um, that is because we add it to salt. It does not naturally occur in high amounts of salt, but we added it to salt because we know that Americans consume a lot of salt and this significantly reduced deficiencies um, in any place that, was, that had iodized salt. Other things, haddock, this is a type of fish, uh, and seaweed, three ounces, has a lot of iodine. Um, some people sometimes eat maybe seaweed salad or seaweed when they have Japanese food or dried seaweed crackers, so those could be sources of iodide as well. Deficiency. So I talked a little bit about a goiter, and now we're going to talk about some other issues with deficiency. So when you have low iodine levels, you will have low levels of T4. And I mentioned that T4 is a thyroid hormone. And so in an attempt to increase your hormone production, you will secrete something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. And that will cause the thyroid gland to enlarge in an attempt to take up more iodine and this goiter will form. This can cause many impacts on metabolism because those thyroid hormones are important for all metabolism-based processes. This can also be a huge issue for infants and developing children. And so women who are pregnant with iodine deficiency can have low birth weight babies, babies can have neurological disorders, poor physical development, and something called cretinism. And cretinism is a restriction of brain growth characterized by mental retardation, speech and hearing difficulties, sometimes muscle spasms and short statue. And according to the World Health Organization, this is the greatest single cause of preventable brain damage and retardation worldwide. And so the World Health Organization actually has goals to try to reduce this sufficiently within the next 10 years by iodizing different things, meaning adding iodine to different food products, um, such as salt, which it is already added to in some cases, but also milk, oil, and other foods. And 30% of the world still does not have access to iodized salt. So if they're eating plants that grow in soils that are not rich in iodine, or they're not eating seaweed or other good sources of it, they are at risk for iodine deficiency. Okay, so iodine toxicity can also happen. And remember, we said that iodine deficiency as well as iodine toxicity can also form a goiter. And toxicity has been seen in Japan due to very high intakes of seaweed um, and also in Chile due to some environmental contaminants. Selenium. So selenium is another mineral from periodic table of elements. And selenium is a very important part of our antioxidant defense system. It helps prevent lipid oxidation and cell membrane damage. And specifically, 
it spares vitamin E from vitamin E having to act as an antioxidant so that vitamin E can be used for other things. So selenium can help destroy free radicals and kind of free up vitamin E from being needed, needed as much. One of the specific antioxidant enzymes that selenium plays a role in is called glutathione peroxidase. And selenium also plays a role in converting this thyroid hormone from the circulating form, T4, to the active form, T3. And selenium may also play a role in immunity. Immunity, there we go. Sources and recommendations. So selenium is found in seafood, meat, cereals, grains, um, ham, chicken, steak, sardines, oysters, and also Brazil nuts, which I don't know why they're not on this chart, um, but there's a nut called a Brazil nut, which is a pretty big nut. It's kind of, it's about, it's about this big. Um, and Brazil nuts are really, really high in selenium. So like one Brazil nut would meet the RDA for selenium. Chromium. So again, this looks like a piece of metal. It's so interesting to think that we need these things in our diet. Um, but we don't need big chunks of chromium metal. We need tiny, tiny, tiny ions of chromium. And so chromium is required for glucose uptake into cells and it helps increase the function of insulin. And so when people have low chromium levels, we sometimes see reduced glucose control. There is an adequate intake established for chromium and it's 25 to 35 micrograms per day. And on average, Americans get 30 micrograms. So most Americans are meeting this. There is not an upper limit established from foods, but it is possible that somebody could be exposed to environmental contaminants um, in chemicals or water or agriculture, and then that could cause some toxicity. Fluoride. So I think many people know fluoride is good for their teeth, so that is absolutely true. It's also important for bones. Main functions of fluoride. So fluoride helps protect our teeth and keep them more resistant to being degraded from bacteria that produce acid and from plaques. It helps remineralize, meaning put calcium, phosphorus back into the enamel of our tooth and reduce the loss of those minerals from our teeth. And it has an antibacterial effect. So I think this is actually meant to say why is fluoride added to the water in North America versus what is fluoride added to in North America, but it is added to water. Um, and the reason for this is to reduce cavities. They started doing studies in the 1940s on this, and they found that when fluoride was added to the water, 20 to 80% of cavities were reduced in children. And so they um, experimented a little bit with the optimum levels of fluoride to find which level would reduce cavities the most efficiently without causing any other issues, which we're gonna talk about coming up. Other sources of fluoride besides our water. So tea sometimes has it, seafood, seaweed, and toothpaste and mouthwash. You are not supposed to swallow toothpaste or mouthwash. However, it is possible that you're getting a little bit of fluoride just from using those products. When I was a little girl, the water was not fluorid, fluoridated in this city, and so we had to get fluoride drops prescribed to us. And every night at dinner, I had to sit and drink a glass of water that had fluoride drops in it, and I absolutely despised it. And I still got cavities. But I think because I was not very good at drinking that water, I often refused or threw a little fit about it. Okay, so fluorosis, deficiency and excess. So acute deficient or acute toxicity can happen. Um, so I should specify this. This is acute toxicity. And so this would be a, say a child gets a hold of a tube of toothpaste and eats it all. 
they could actually get fluoride poisoning. Um, it could cause vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, convulsions, and coma. It is a neurotoxin. Chronic toxicity would be a lower level of toxicity, but over a long period of time. And chronic toxicity causes modeling of the teeth, which is otherwise known as fluorosis. Um, I always spell fluoride wrong. Fluorosis. Um, anyways, I'm sorry my writing is horrible, but you can understand the word I'm trying to say. And this is just a little picture of fluorosis and um, how it's kind of building up. So normal, questionable, very mild, mild, moderate, and severe. And fluorosis actually, in the severe case, causes these brown spots on the teeth, which are literally just cosmetic defects. They're not painful at all. There is some thought that they could cause a little bit of pitting into the enamel, but people with fluorosis actually have some of the lowest rates of cavities of any people worldwide. And so when this disease was first discovered, it was actually called Colorado brown, brown tooth or Colorado brown, tooth, brown spot tooth disease. And what a flattering name for disease, right? But all of the people in this small little town in Colorado had brown teeth like this, and nobody could really understand why. But one thing they observed um, is that these people had lower rates of cavities. And so they tested the water, they tested the water, they thought it might be lead, they thought it might be mercury, they had no idea what it was. And finally, in another town across the United States, they saw a similar thing. This particular town, there was a water purification plant. That water purification plant had very sophisticated testing facilities. And so they did some testing and they actually found that it was fluoride in the water. And so after this, they started adding fluoride to the water, not in amounts high enough to cause this browning of the teeth, um, um, but in amounts that would be sufficient to prevent cavities. Okay, so this is a pretty cool chart from the end of your book and the end of this chapter in your book, and it just talks about deficiencies, toxicities, functions, and sources of some of these trace minerals. So I think this would be a good study tool as you get ready for your final. All right, some more trivia. So which of the following is suggested to help control blood glucose? Maybe you said chromium. Females are at higher risk than males for deficiency of which minerals? Maybe you said iron. The end. Okay, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this lecture. All right, bye.